Greetings, Earth and Space Explorers. Welcome to Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report for Friday, December 17, 2021. I'm your host, Bill Waller, an astronomer, science educator, and communicator coming to you on a cool moonlit evening in Rockport, Massachusetts. These Earth and Space Reports are intended to engage and inform people like you who are curious about Earth as a planet, who care about our life-sustaining environment, and who wonder about the greater cosmos, including our place in space and moment in time. Video recordings of these reports are archived on the Earth and Space Reports YouTube channel. They are also in regular rotation on the 1623 Studios Community Access Cable Channel 12. I am grateful for the continuing interest and support shown by members of the Rockport Research Explorers, Rockport Cultural Council, Gloucester Area Astronomy Club, sundry science colleagues, far-flung friends, family, and other curious folk. Thank you for participating. This evening, I will be hosting an interactive Earth and Space Year in Review. We will start with Dr. Jay Pasikoff of Williams College, who will tell us a bit about his trip to Antarctica, where he witnessed the total solar eclipse that occurred there on December 4. Then I will continue with a summary of what has transpired on Earth over the past year, and then finish up my summary of what has been happening in space and finish by opening the platform to everybody so that you can share your own stories relating to this past year. So let's get to it. I'm going to move on. Uh, I think we're good for Jay. I'm going to unmute you, uh, ask to unmute. You're unmuted. Okay, you're good. Okay. okay, thank you very much. I'm glad to be visiting my old friend Bill Waller and to brief you on this very interesting total solar eclipse uh, that we had uh, almost a couple of weeks ago. I've got to advance here. Let's see. Uh, we're screen sharing, but all right, well, maybe that one works. Um, so here's, uh, first of all, a picture that, that we've uh, arranged from. The last eclipse I saw, total eclipse, I saw where there was a double diamond ring at the beginning and uh, and then a single diamond ring, Bailey's beads at uh, at the end last year, uh, two years ago in, in July, 2019 from Chile. And then last year in Chile, we couldn't get there and, uh, and it was cloudy where I would have gone. You're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th. And, uh, and anyway, there's this odd picture from the Discover satellite that shows the moon blocking uh, blocking the Earth. And, uh, and does Bill remember Donald Menzel, who uh, uh, went to so I, many meetings, developed his doodling skills? So, yeah, uh, I saw him uh, my first days at uh, the Harvard Smithsonian. So anyway, what we're, what we're studying, especially, are these polar plumes and the equatorial streamers, and we want to see uh, what the eclipse is like. And of course, the total solar eclipse is just off the charts. Uh, interesting. So here is the eclipse over Antarctica. So here's actually the shadow of the moon falling in Antarctica in this very unusual and remarkable view. Uh, our science goals, I'm going to uh, rush through them, but we're studying the magnetic field and coronal mass ejections. And we have spectra, and we're looking for how the corona got to be uh, a million degrees. And here is a picture that I took from 41,000 feet. I was on an airplane uh, that was over uh, the ocean east of Punta Arenas at the tip of Chile, uh, kind of surrounded by uh, uh, the Southern Ocean Bay near Antarctica, where there were 14 cruise ships, 13 of which were clouded out. Which was a good reason not to go on a cruise ship for image that. I took. Uh, so here was our plan to leave uh, Punta Arenas and fly uh, and fly and get the sunrise point out the window, and then uh, and then the path the path of totality went over Union Glacier, and I did have equipment with two groups of people uh, here, so we have data from them uh, from them too, um, and and so we flew out. Uh, after midnight and a couple hours, and then had a, a, a run for the eclipse for uh, just about a couple of minutes. 
and uh, it was uh, due south of New York. I was amused that we went south uh, the whole way, the compass heading. And uh, um, anyway, we're at the minimum, we're coming off the minimum of the sunspot cycle uh, now. And, uh, uh, and I had two students from Williams College uh, with me and an alumnus who uh, we all worked and flew down to Punta Arenas. And here I am with my traditional orange pants uh, from the plane. We had a Latam last minute substitution of a 787, uh, uh, which was not helpful compared to the Airbuses, but it had to be done for, for safety reasons because of the extended range of the 787. So anyway, I had my, uh, my uh, students here and, uh, and we worked away. Here, uh, my wife Naomi and I are about to uh, board there. So we flew out and they have to be in exactly the right place at the right time. So I'd make a little loop to loop. Uh, and, uh, um, and anyway, we got this, eventually this uh, good view. Here I am with the, ca with the captain, the tour organizer. So it was just after sunrise. So um, I did have, uh, uh, some some colleagues and students are with me getting a lot of of uh, images and uh, and one of the things we were doing is working with people at predictive science in in San Diego who make predictions based on the last month of of uh, magnetic field data which they get from the solar dynamics observatory and uh, if you go to the NASA website here a couple of days after the eclipse, but this is actually a slider where you can see their whole view or our whole view, uh, where we started to reduce our uh, our, uh, our our images, and uh, and uh, uh, and we're matching pretty well what uh, what happens there. But they make these predictions in advance, and then when we provide the actual observations, they can improve the predictions. Uh, for the uh, next time. So this is their full prediction and you can see the streamers that were predicted in this part of the solar activity cycle. There are just polar plumes, there aren't streamers coming out of the high latitude. This is a logarithmic view of those uh, predictions and I'll skip over the, this, this is a wavelet analysis. So there's a lot going on, magnetic field map. So here is uh, one of our images, our whole images and you can see some streamers coming out here. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we continue to work on improving those, uh, those observations. Uh, we do have spectra and uh, uh, we can see uh, spectral lines from gases, uh, magnetic uh, iron. Here's a clearer view. Iron 14 is 13 times ionized iron, which means it's gotta be a million and a half degrees up there. And the ratio of the lower ionization still very hot, almost a million and a million and a half, uh, uh, it gets hotter and hotter as the corona gets hotter in the sunspot cycle. And we had with us Aris Bulgaris from Greece with a couple of spectrographs. Uh, so uh, Andreas Muller from Germany was uh, on the same plane. And here's one of, uh, one of his uh, images there as the uh, eclipse ended and uh, we're working away to compile our own images with all our data and uh, and in particular there are spacecraft data in the extreme ultraviolet you can see on the center of the uh, so, so we paste that over the what would otherwise be dark because that's the corona also and then you can make there's a spacecraft that makes an artificial eclipse but it can't get close to the sun just because this is so bright, it's about a thousand times, fades about a thousand times from here to here. So you can't do that all together. And, uh, and so we have the outer corona from space on the solar and heliospheric observatory. And then only on the days of eclipses, about every 18 months or so, can we fill in the, uh, the view from, uh, uh, from the ground. Let me just move advance a little bit. So here again is the solar ultraviolet imager which is on the one that goes spacecraft and then our eclipse image and how that merges. You see how that stream emerges with the uh, solar and heliospheric observatory. 
So that's what I have to say. Now we had a, it, it all worked. We were very nervous about all kinds of <laughs> logistical things and travel and observing and, and, but we've got some good imaging and we're gonna work on it for the, for, for quite a while. Well, thank you, Jay. Um, that's quite a, a unique, you, you've gone to how many eclipses now? Well, 74 eclipses, solar eclipses. Yeah. Uh, starting when I was a freshman at Harvard, and this was my 36th total eclipse. Yeah, that, that's uh, record making. <laughs> so we're watching this. So anyway, thank you for inviting me, Bill. Okay. And we'll, talk, we'll talk again. Have fun with your students tonight. Thank you. Well, yeah, the reason I'm rushing away is I'm giving a review session for the exam they're giving yeah. tomorrow, scheduled at the same hour. So thanks, everybody who is listening for listening. Okay, Jay. good. Thank All you, right. Jay. Don't forget to uh, unshare your screen. Okay, I will do that. There we go. Okay. okay, excellent. So now it's my time. Turn to share, share my screen. Screen sharing. Okay. And slideshow from the beginning. Bill, does your mind look like that's uh, your desktop? Does what? Does your mind look like that desktop? Uh, always. <laughs> it gets much worse, when, especially when I'm putting something together. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Jay's presentation is a beautiful blending of Earth and space because we're, we're seeing uh, the sun being blocked out by the moon from Earth's vantage point. Uh, but now we will go back to uh, what's going on on Earth for the past uh, year. So uh, a, a lot of what is happening on Earth is, is just continuing. The Earth continues to spin, you know, once every 24 hours and orbiting around the sun once every 365 days. That's not changing much, certainly over the uh, progress of a year, uh, maybe over the progress of tens of thousands of years, uh, the Earth's spinning might change and the orbit might change a little bit and its tilt might change a little bit. But um, those, those two basic properties of Earth are pretty much constant. Uh, but there are strange churnings lurking in its interior. And this is just a model, a cartoon, uh, showing the solid inner core of uh, iron and nickel uh, surrounded by the molten outer core of iron and nickel. And it's, it's the swirling currents in the molten component that is thought to produce the magnetic field of Earth. And um, that does change. And as we can see, uh, the magnetic field has been, um, let me change, what do we want? I just want speaker. There we go, okay. So, um, for some reason we have Michael. But anyway, um, this is the magnetic field strength. And uh, it was high in 1700 and it has been continuing to decline um, over a long period of time of centuries. And it, it brings up the possibility that um, the field might go to zero, you know, to basically a scrambled field and then possibly reverse itself. There have been field reversals in the distant past. And so that's that's a possibility left open, um, and, but it's controversial, we don't know. Meanwhile, the North Magnetic Pole has been wandering since the 1600s and 1700s. That was when, it was when way down here at a 70 degree latitude uh, in Canada. Uh, and it has been wandering ever since, uh, such that it's up around here, and uh, it now has a latitude of 86 degrees, not quite the, um, the pole of the spin axis, uh, but uh, it, it does seem to wander around. So that's been going on. Okay, uh, earthquakes. Um, the, uh, the mantle, uh, the molten part of the mantle, or shall we say the pliable part of the mantle, um, has currents and um, that causes the tectonic plates to uh, move around. And um, 
those plates butt up against each other in certain places and those produce uh, earthquakes from time to time. And these were the largest 20 earthquakes this past year. And I wanna bring to your attention uh, this strong one uh, near Antarctica, uh, an 8.1 magnitude, uh, one in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, and then um, one in Chile. That was the deadliest one. It's a, not as strong, but uh, that had more than 2,000 fatalities as a result. And that also brings up a point that sometimes these earthquakes are aftershocks of prior earthquakes. There was a huge earthquake. Um, I, I don't remember the year, but it was uh, in, in, in the 2000s, which really devastated Haiti and really hasn't recovered since. Uh, there's also one in, um, is this Indonesia? Yeah, 7.1. And I think that's the Sulawesi uh, earthquake. And this is the sort of damage that it can cause, Sulawesi, Indonesia. And this is a, a governor's office building uh, that was just completely destroyed by the, uh, the Temblor. All right, volcanoes. Volcanoes are uh, continuing to be active. Like the earthquakes, they tend to be uh, associated with uh, tectonic plates, which are butting up against what, one another, usually in subduction zones, one, one plate's going underneath another one. Uh, and I wanna bring your attention to uh, La Palma, uh, which has been um, erupting quite a bit. It prevented a colleague of mine from going to a conference there. And um, I'll show you a picture of Mount Etna, which is, is reviving as well. Um, Kilauea in Hawaii is also uh, erupting. And there are several uh, volcanoes in, in the um, area of uh, Indonesia. And I think there was a, a recent eruption in, in Semeru, I'm not really sure. Um, so, uh, the earth continues to be active. Here is a, a very recent photograph, December 14 of Mount Etna in Sicily. And so um, it, that prevented travel and, uh, and gathering on that island of Sicily near Italy. And then there are the forest fires across the globe um, because of the parched areas. There's a, there was a lot of heat in um, all across the globe. And July seemed to be an especially hot month. It's the hottest month ever recorded uh, with some places uh, exceeding 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that um, there, there were a lot of forest fires in California and British Columbia, I'll, I'll point them out, but also a fair bit in the, in the Southeast Mass, uh, the United States as in uh, South America and um, Africa, uh, kind of like below the, the, uh, the, the, the wettest areas. Uh, Australia had its fiercest forest fires last year, but it was still a lot with, um, with forest fires. And then, oh yes, the, uh, the Siberia has been lit up with a lot of forest fires. And where there's fire, there's smoke. And here's North America. And you can spot some of these fires. Uh, this one is in British Columbia, but also Washington and Oregon had uh, fires, uh, as uh, well as in California once again, and in the Tahoe area right here. And some of the smoke made its way, courtesy of the jet stream at stratospheric altitudes, all the way to uh, the Northeast in Massachusetts where I live. And we had some very hazy days uh, this past summer. And uh, the result of forest fires is that they remove foliage along with the root systems and that exposes the, uh, the land to flooding if you get rain uh, and even landslides. And uh, this shows the incidences of uh, flooding uh, across the world. And um, 
Europe and the Netherlands and in Germany really got hit hard, uh, as did China over here. Where's China? China over here. And I'll just show you some photos from there. I, I think Australia did too, but they don't seem to have a number there. So, okay. So here are the Netherlands, uh, flooding in the Netherlands. And I'm not sure whether this is the Netherlands or Germany, but obviously there was a big landslide here. And here's a, a major metropolitan district in China uh, inundated uh, due to the flooding uh, at higher altitudes. Okay, so that's uh, all the fun we've been having. Um, a lot of it can be attributed to global warming and uh, the addition of energy to the atmosphere. Um, but there's also uh, atmospheric phenomena which can be attributed to the La Nina uh, event, event, which is, uh, has kicked in. And this is a uh, La Nina lasts about three to five years. It's the opposite of El Nino. Uh, it, with La Nina, you get a cooling off of uh, Peru in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And that cooling um, changes the, uh, the circulation patterns. Uh, and the jet streams and the corresponding weather. And here is what is predicted for um, the United States. Uh, with the jet stream like so, uh, you have colder weather um, in the upper Midwest, uh, wet weather uh, in California, Northern California and uh, Oregon and Washington and British Columbia. So that should be helpful with regard to the fires, um, though you might get more flooding. The um, uh, southwest will be drier and the southeast will be drier. And so that just is going to add to the drought that the southwest has been experiencing for several years now. Uh, we here in the northeast seem to, to be getting wetter. Not good for amateur astronomy. <laughs> Uh, and so um, I don't know whether the La Nina, La Nina affects the hurricane season. It seems to have been a busy uh, hurricane season, third most active with 12 named storms, five hurricanes and three major hurricanes. I guess those are category four and five. And based on the color code, it looks like Ida and Grace had the highest uh, winds. Um, and I'm not really sure which ones had the greatest amount of damage. Uh, as I recall, those were the ones that hit Louisiana. And putting a face on a name, you can see that several of these hurricanes had eyes. Uh, Ida had, had a well-developed eye along with, where's the other one? I don't know the name of this one. <laughs> I can't see. That. So I'm gonna move on to the typhoon season, which are basically hurricanes uh, in the Pacific, the West Pacific. And um, they had several category four and five storms. And um, I think most of the damage uh, occurred near the Philippines. You can see this one got to be some pretty high uh, wind velocities. And in addition to hurricanes, tornadoes, which are smaller, but uh, more intense with higher wind velocities, there's an estimate of about 1,100 tornadoes that occurred in the United States, including uh, twisters in both the Midwest and the Southeast. And uh, it, this one's a hard one to read, annual count. They talk about inflation adjusted tornado trend, but it looks like um, they're following this this black line, this is the line. And this is an accumulation plot of uh, the number of tornadoes. And you can see that the slope is high from April through July, but then it starts to flatten out with fewer and fewer tornadoes. But we just had a big tornado in um, Mayfield, Kentucky and elsewhere in the, Kentucky and Tennessee and Missouri, uh, including a tornado that has had the longest track ever, 250 miles. 
And um, this before and after just is stunning with the, uh, with the candle factory before and then after it's just obliterated um, as, as was this other building here. Uh, these tornadoes can really shred buildings. Meanwhile, um, there was a major summit uh, in November. World leaders, scientists, and activists, they gathered in Glasgow, Scotland for the 26th UN Climate Summit. And um, you might recognize this fellow, Boris Johnson, and uh, this fellow, I can't remember his name, um, but he is a, a major um, author and TV personality. Uh, talking David about Attenborough. Him. Say it again, D David Attenborough. Thank you. That's right. And he, um, he, uh, Boris Johnson really set the stage uh, as the host in the UK, uh, as uh, basically a now or never uh, to try to keep the, uh, the global temperature down to 1.5 degrees, the, the, the change in uh, temperature. And uh, I liked what. Joe Biden said, we know what to do, we've just got to do it. So against this backdrop, um, we all await <laughs> policy changes that will make it happen. Uh, of course, our climate is driven by the sun <laughs> um, and we are just tweaking it by adding photochemical gases in our atmosphere. Uh, so daytime and much of the nighttime is ruled by the sun and um, it has finally begun to awake from its magnetic slumber. As Jay Pascoff said, there are now sunspots. This is a very recent um, showing of sunspots. Uh, I think it was December 14th or so, uh, very recent. And then this is um, uh, an H alpha image of the sun uh, showing the active regions where the sunspots are and the magnetic loops between the poles of the, of the sunspots. Uh, there's also prominences jutting out from the surface of the sun and filaments, which are basically prominences seen against the face of the sun. And so we're starting to get some activity. It has been a long, low period in the 11 year cycle. And so uh, we now have something to look at. <laughs> this is good for people with solar telescopes. And then um, getting back to Jay's eclipse that occurred December 4, passed over the Antarctic continent. And so that would be summertime in the Antarctic. And so they, this is the land of the midnight sun right now. And you can see that uh, even at midnight, the sun is above the horizon. And I don't know which way it goes. Maybe it goes this way. Uh, and then sometime around midday, they had the eclipse and uh, pretty neat. And nighttime sky. Uh, nighttime sky has stuff which can be attributed to our atmosphere, thunderstorms, of course, in the troposphere and above the, the thunderstorms, once they get up a little bit higher, uh, like the, the superstorms, uh, they can produce these sprites. It's a sprite phenomenon. I don't know, don't know anything about the blue jet phenomenon, but there are sprites, Steve's and Aurori at even higher altitudes between 100 and 200 kilometer altitudes. Um, and the neat thing is they're being recorded with ever greater fidelity. And as an example, I'm gonna show this brief uh, video. Okay, here we go. So at 100,000 frames per second. So here's the sprite, the actual color. It glows in the light of excited atomic oxygen. And away we go. So it's fascinating to see the discrete nature of these 
of these events that they're, they're little balls of uh, excited oxygen gas, uh, which, and I don't know what the excitation mechanism, it, it, it's something to do with the storms, the, the thunderstorms. So um, that's where the electrons are coming to bombard the oxygen and get it excited. Also at even higher altitudes, so we're dealing now with constellations of satellites, which are marring astronomers' long exposure images of the cosmos. And here is a, uh, a basically a network of uh, constellations of satellites. I think this is for Amazon, I'm not really sure, but you can see that there, it's, it's starting to number in the thousands. And this is what they do to long exposure images of, uh, of, of the cosmos. Here we have some background galaxies, and these are the streaks, which are um, really making observing from the ground at optical wavelengths problematic. And I'm just hoping that uh, these private companies will be reined in uh, with some decent policies. Uh, moving farther out, we, we we did have a comet. We do have a comet. It's just uh, coming into the daytime sky um, here in the northern hemisphere. Um, it's called Comet Leonard, and um, I haven't seen it myself yet. But um, this is a lovely photo that was uh, taken by Dan Bartlett and shown in a, the astronomy picture of the day. And here it's uh, upstaging the globular cluster M3, which is another thirty thousand light years away. <laughs> So this is a relatively nearby object, which is just a, you know, a, a few light hours away or, or less, a few light minutes away. And here's an artist's conception of uh, the night sky. Uh, we have a, a, a lovely lineup right now of uh, planets beginning with Venus and then moving on to Saturn, Jupiter, the asteroid Pallas, uh, Neptune, uh, the moon, actually the moon is way over to the left right now uh, in a near full phase, uh, Uranus and another asteroid series. Uh, I don't have much to say about uh, these planets. Uh, Venus, um, the latest news is that the claim of phosphine in its atmosphere, uh, this is an interesting compound uh, because uh, on earth it's associated with life mostly rotting, stinking life. And so they think, oh, wow, phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus might indicate some sort of life processes going on. However, that detection has not been confirmed well. It's basically one spectral line in the radio. Uh, Saturn uh, has plans to go to Titan uh, with a, a satellite that will investigate uh, the, the Titan terrain in a really neat way. I can't remember the name. Uh, it's not Grasshopper, is it? Well, uh, jumping to Jupiter, uh, the Jove satellite uh, has an orbit that goes over the poles and it's showing fabulous pictures of the atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, Neptune uh, has, can only be spotted with a uh, telescope and Uranus possibly with the uh, binoculars, though I haven't had much luck. All right, Ceres and Pallas. Uh, I think Pallas has been visited by a spacecraft and um, we might be getting another, yet another sample return soon from another uh, asteroid. Um, this is a fun thing. Um, more than 400 years ago, people like Galileo uh, were sketching the moon based on observations through the telescopes that they had available at the time. These are Galileo's sketches. And that tradition continues today with sketches by uh, Dick Lukey. And in order to get to that, I'm gonna go to his gallery and close. And you can see he was busy in 2020 and 2021. And uh, we'll start here. Well, maybe here. I don't know if that's a, does that count for 2020? I'm not sure. But we'll go to this 
this this shows the terminator the the, the night day uh, switch from uh, from nighttime to daytime on the moon and that was in march and uh, he he shows these various uh, craters and i don't know what crater this is uh, dick is at a concert tonight so he can't tell me <laughs> but this is uh, on a black uh, black paper and now he's using uh, white crayon. I think this this works out rather nicely. And this is the Copernicus crater, one of the larger craters on the moon. And he's showing some of the details of uh, the rim. And um, apparently the, uh, the middle of the crater is filled with material that has a, a different shading than the, the outside of the, uh, of the moon due to stuff that probably upwelled. And oh, yeah, this is the last one, Crater Julius Caesar. And uh, here he's using a gray background, uh, which does, he enables him to use both black and white. So I encourage uh, those of you who, who like to draw uh, to try your hand at sketching the moon. Okay, so I am done with Dick. All right. Other amateur astronomers uh, do astrophotography and um, they are getting better and better. Uh, the equipment's getting better and better in 2021. Uh, and uh, the software for um, processing the images is just getting better and better. And um, this example uh, from Phil Orbanes, a member of the Gloucester Area Astronomy Club, pretty much uh, exemplifies what can be done with a uh, telescope of rather modest aperture, uh, but with a good camera and uh, filters and uh, post-processing. So you see, uh, for example, this is the Orion Nebula. And I don't, the something man nebula, the walking man nebula. And this is M101. And this is, uh, which is, uh, fabulous, and all the red things are brilliant star forming regions. Here's M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is an interacting galaxy. And then I believe this is M83, a barred spiral galaxy, again with beautiful roseate regions uh, due to intense star formation. Okay. So moving way out past these galaxies, uh, I want to highlight the Chime Radio Observatory in British Columbia uh, as, as it just released its first large set of data on these so-called fast radio bursts, FRBs. They are a great mystery uh, because they, you know, occur anywhere in the sky and they, um, they occur very briefly and they often do not repeat. And so uh, it, it, it's hard to get a handle on them. Uh, there are a few FRBs that have been matched up with uh, galaxies, very distant galaxies. So we believe that they are extragalactic, meaning they are beyond our Milky Way galaxy. And the neat thing about this telescope is that it really is a, a wonderful FRB discovery machine because with these cylindrical collectors, uh, they have a beam on the sky, which is this this big oblong beam. And so they can scan the sky, which is shown here, uh, very efficiently. And then they, they use software to pin down where along this beam the source occurred. And so they, they're able to locate the source in the sky uh, to uh, high precision. And the output is basically uh, frequency dependent, that uh, the bursts last a very short amount of time. I believe this axis is the time axis and that's in milliseconds. And um, you can see that dependent on the frequency, the, the profile of the burst in time can change. And um, that is called, um, just that produces dispersion, <coughs> excuse me. It's, it's a, and the measure of that is called the dispersion measure, how much the, the, 
the pulse changes uh, with frequency. And they basically integrate this thing, this plot ov over time. And that gives you a, a measure of how, how much uh, the, the signal has been messed with. And it gets messed with by free electrons along the line of sight. Those free electrons, in the case of pulsars in our own galaxy, are due to material in our galaxy, free electrons in our galaxy. And you can see that the dispersion measures are, are on the order of uh, 100 to 200 or so. But as studied by Jerry Zhu at the Cape Fear Academy, who I had the privilege of mentoring, uh, the dispersion measures are much higher uh, on the order of 500 to 600. Some people say that's because these objects are very far away and the intergalactic medium, you know, it, 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 the, the, the travel through the intergalactic medium is, is uh, having its effect with the free electrons in the intergalactic medium. But just as possible, it could be that these objects are embedded inside their own nebulae. And the, and the possibility is that we're looking at magnetars, highly magnetized erupting stellar systems, which are surrounded by their own nebulae, just like pulsars are surrounded by uh, uh, supernova remnants. And uh, of course, the, uh, the court is out on this, but this is a very, ex I, I find a very interesting finding that uh, Jerry Zhu was able to um, show. So that's, that's basically the science for today. Uh, moving on, the James Webb Space Telescope, we're all waiting for its launch. And I just checked, it's scheduled for Christmas Eve, December 24. This is a big telescope, a 6.5 meter uh, diameter telescope. Uh, compare that with the 2.4 meter telescope, 2.4 meter diameter telescope of the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, this is gonna be big. It's gonna be operating in the infrared mostly. Uh, but it's going to peer farther back uh, in space-time uh, to the dark ages to, to reveal galaxies that, that are just forming in the cosmos. And then also will um, reveal uh, basically the environments of planets on, in formation around other stars and, and some fully mature planets. There's a chance that we, it might be able to see some um, some planets around stars, and it also uh, it's a big light bucket, and so the spectra that it, it, it gathers will also give us important information on planets that happen to be transiting in front of their stars. So it's a very exciting telescope, and so uh, this is it. Uh, what Earth and space happenings have been engaging you the past twelve months? or I've engaged you in the past 12 months. And so I ask that you use the chat to enter your name and I will call on you in sequence. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Oops, stop sharing my screen and we'll have at it. Splendid, for, thank you, Bill. So uh, if we don't have any folks who want to Speak, uh, uh, oh, uh, Mike, do you want to show your telescope? I said oh. sure, but I was muted. Okay, oh, I got to unmute everybody. And so that's under participants. We can unmute ourselves. Okay. Good, oh, there yeah, it is. Yeah, so anyway, there was, there was that. Let me uh, see if that works. Just to show off, really, that's all it is. Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Do you want to name the guy's name? Give the guy's name? Shout out? Uh, yeah, uh, Ryan Goodson. He's in uh, Dinwiddie, um, Virginia. And that's his company, New Moon Telescopes. He's meeting me in Connecticut with the scope. Uh, that's black walnut and uh, carbon fiber uh, with a very lightweight uh, secondary cage. Um, the 4.1 inch secondary. I couldn't believe how much it cost me for a secondary mirror, more than my first telescope. Is it just a flat? It's a it's a 45 degree flat. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
Hmm. Um, yeah, this is going to be 500 beautiful. bucks. <laughs> for, for, for the secondary, which is up here. For the secondary, yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. But uh, it's, uh, it's cool that uh, the, uh, the trusses are all one piece, one big uh, folding uh, finger handcuff piece that collapses down uh, instead of individual tubes, which makes putting the secondary cage on uh, that much easier. So let me, we've all seen enough of that. Hang on. Okay. Yeah, that's a sweet, um, sweet scope. Well, I remember views through your 18 inch, Michael, uh, views of Mars in 2006, when it was- yeah, That last really awesome. good apparition that we had. Back it was a few amazing. Years now. I felt like I was just floating above the Martian surface. It was yeah. just fabulous. This should put you on the Martian surface. <laughs> this is the best 20 inch primary mirror money will buy. God damn. Period. Yeah. So well, don't. The reason I got a 20 when I already had an 18 F5 um, is that I'm going to be 70 years old next year. And I yeah. wanted to trim some bulk and weight um, away from my telescope without sacrificing aperture. Mm -hmm. So instead of the structure of the thing with the mirror box and the rocker box being made out of thick plywood, which most of them are, mm -hmm. uh, this is made out of hardwood sheets. And it, it, it's very lightweight. Um, and the mirror itself only weighs 30 pounds. It's a 20 inch mirror and it weighs 30 pounds. And um, you can haul it like a wheelbarrow. I don't intend to haul it like a wheelbarrow. I intend to pick it up and walk out into the field and put it down on my equatorial table. When I'm done, pick it up, go back to the van, and put it in the van. So hmm. I could do that when I was 20. Why can't I do it now? <laughs> but that's the plan i want to Let be able count to use the the scope until you know i'm 80 and that's that's with my best guess at it cool that's really cool and while we, we hope to uh see you uh with star at star parties uh at halibut point state park uh that you've managed to um secure once again and uh of course we'll do our gorilla astronomy around uh, gloucester and rockport uh, perhaps on New Year's Eve. Perhaps on New Year's Eve in, down by Dock Square. Right. We have insurance now, million dollar liability. Okay. So, yeah. so you can <laughs> trip people as they walk by. It won't matter. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Paul, uh, what's new in the uh, ham world? Uh, have you been able to, um, uh, what are the atmospheric conditions that you've, you've experienced? You'll have to unmute, Paul. Yeah, no. Well, of course, the thing Oh, you're not coming in well, Paul. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, shut you down. Okay. That's too bad. Uh, you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, try again. Now? Yeah, you're better now. Hold on. All right, yeah. I'll get closer to the machine too. Okay. That might make a difference. Well, the big the big thing basically is um, uh, the return of a cycle um, twenty five or the start of twenty five. Um, That's I the solar noticed, cycle. Huh? Solar cycle. Yeah. I just noticed that within the last hour, they're they're running a solar flux of one oh one at the um, zero hour Greenwich mean time update. So that's pretty high. I didn't check the solar uh, wind. Yeah. But the sun's starting to get a little more active, which for hams is, uh, is good, as long as you don't start having a lot of solar flares, of which there was uh, one earlier today. They can knock out the day side pretty badly. Um, Tamath is uh, right now, Tamath is Gove, it was a WX6SWW, has extensive um, what she calls space weather uh, seminars, mini courses on um, on YouTube, and you can watch them. And um, so, her argument is that the um, the the Earth's ionosphere and so on is incredibly complex, and it's virtually impossible at this point to predict it. 
So uh, anybody want to get really involved in that, they can do it. But solar uh, cycle 25 will uh, dominate what happens in ham radio because when it was dead last year, it was dead. Yeah. And um, now and now is the major reason for um, it getting better with the more active by. sun? Um, I didn't want to know something. Too. Did you mention something? Yes, of course, yeah. What's happening is you're getting more activity and it's sending more ionization to Earth, okay? Um, that's actually not so bad because during the low ionization period, the minimums, we get a lot more cosmic rays. But when the uh, ionosphere is ionized, um, it rejects a lot of the cosmic rays. Of course, you get things like the Carrington event in 1859, which was where a telegraph wires acted as antennas and they burned down uh, telegraph offices and things like that. <laughs> Probably a lot of you know that in March of uh, 1989, that was in 1859, by the way, the Carrington thing. Um, in, in March of, um, and I remember this, March of 89, um, the Quebec power line went down during a storm. What is emerging now since the cycle is starting up again is that the, um, and I'm just realizing this from listening to her, that the GPS is um, going to be affected or is affected by the solar weather. Mm. And you, you most of these satellites, at least the ham ones, but a lot of like uh, sensing satellites for the Earth um, are um, small, low Earth orbit satellites. And the Earth's atmosphere expands when we get hit by like a coronal mass ejection. And that creates more dynamic uh, drag on the satellites. So all of these little satellites, including the GPS ones, kind of could get knocked off their position which is not too good for a GPS satellite. But mm. um, I, th I think you're gonna start hearing more of this as it goes along. There's a lot of people out there freaking out about it, but that, that, that's about it from the, that's most I'm using the last dimension, and I will, that this is the Okay, you're breaking up again, Paul. Breaking up, Paul. I'm going to mute you again. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm all done anyway, though. Okay, good. Okay, I'm that was good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bill Wall, are good. you still there? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? Oh, I got, I got, a, I got a. Yep. I got to mute. What's him. up? Okay, um, so although you've recently retired from your work um, at uh, the uh, Astronomical Institute in Mexico, uh, are you following anything of late? Um, well, I've been, well, I've been involved in, in an astronomy club, as a matter of fact, um, an amateur astronomy club. It's the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and there's a Vancouver uh, uh, chapter here and I've actually I could uh, maybe I should share the screen because there's something I am involved with but uh, cool I, I, I'm not going to take too much time I, I realize time's nearly up but I mean I, I'm going to just show a couple photos of what, what I've been trying to do great um, let's see share the screen okay here and these clubs are all yeah. available to um, to the public right yep we're, we're, we're a charitable organization and uh, my idea was that we should get, and you can see in the photo here, this um, this is a six uh, meter dome. It's a portable planetarium. And I proposed to the club that we buy one of these and give shows, not just to the public, but to our own club members. And it doesn't even have to be shows. Like, I mean, as you can see in the background, the clouds are very common here. So if we can't have starry nights where you can see the actual sky, you can actually see a, a, a virtual sky and you can teach the public as well as our own members or just have, you know, this is the, what the sky looks like right now. And you can just enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can also do um, simulations of light pollution. 
and we can see what the sky would look like with and without light pollution and what proper lighting can do. Uh, we can have cultural shows. We're trying to get First Nations peoples involved. Um, that, that's turning out to be very difficult, but we might actually succeed. So you get, you get an idea of the size of the, of the dome here. The council uh, or club is not um, very enthusiastic about this at the moment because of the price tag, but um, uh, we're, we're a dedicated group of us are still working on this and we may, uh, may eventually succeed. Um, see, this, this is a very simple dome from Digitalis. This is uh, from Bremerton, Washington. They're just south of the border from us. Mm -hmm. um, just showing uh, the, the computer system. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the, on the inside. The, the pictures aren't great on the inside because the Oh, the presenter can exposure. stand? The presenter can what? Stand. Oh, everyone can stand. I mean, it's, it's huge in there. So yeah. it's, um, and you can have chairs in there if you want. We were sitting on the floor, most of us, but some of us had chairs. I know and, kids uh, really love crawling into the, the, the chamber and, oh, yeah. and experiencing yeah. it on the floor. I mean, that's one of the things we want to do with this is not, we're going to be mo mostly for our own club members at the beginning, right? Was we learn how to use it and mm -hmm. show this is the night sky on a starry night. So even if the sky is clear, you can say, uh, this is what the sky looks like. Here are the constellations. So you can orient yourself. So this is, I think, a great idea. But we also want to take this to schools, public schools. Sure. And we can give them shows for free because we're a charitable organization. So we have to, we have to do it for free. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe there'll be a great demand there. We're going to be in touch with teachers and see what they say. But then that's a projector. Um, and here's, uh, yeah, this, uh, this particular, yeah, I think this particular movie was interesting. Yeah, I, I can show one of the movies here, which is very short, but let's see. What I'm showing is how quickly you can disassemble one of these. Hmm. But, uh, <laughs> the flourish at the end, yes. You do need a big room. That's the one drawback. You do need a big room. You need a room with, uh, see, that's 3.7 meters high, so like 11 feet. So you need a, a, high, a high ceiling, fairly big room. Uh, yeah. So, and then he's folding it up after this. So, hmm. but yeah, that was, uh, was a demo that we went to and uh, it, it impressed me. You know, it was a great uh, view. It's not quite as good as analog as far as the stars appear, mm -hmm. not point like stars. They're, right. they're like spots, but they're still quite good. And the sky was nice and dark between the stars. So it was, uh, and you can do, because it's digital, you can do almost anything, show almost anything with it, flying to the planets, flying out of the galaxy and so on. So I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, I think this is maybe a good, uh, it would make a good talk for your club. I mean, for your Earth and Space report, maybe I could talk about the progress I've made with this, like in a year or something, if I'm Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, because okay. your club might find it interesting. I mean, our club is very big. We have like 300 members and we have a big legacy fund and so on. But, but you know, this is something if a, a number of clubs got together, you could maybe get one of your own. Uh, it, it could be quite useful, you know. Well, know. What is the price tag? Uh, yeah, that's the problem. This, uh, including the projector and the software and the dome and everything is going to be, let's see, in American dollars is like $53,000. Mm -hmm. ah. yeah. I know that the... Uh, the Rockport schools, uh, at the least, make use of uh, a portable planetarium. I think they used to get it from the Museum of Science in Boston. Uh, they would come by and um, host the, the show for the kids uh, in the auditorium or in the, in the, maybe in the gymnasium. And so it's, a, it's something that uh, some teachers uh, have some experience with. Yeah. yeah, and we and we have teachers in our club, as a matter of fact. So yeah. we're going to approach them and see if they're interested, because they could actually do, give the shows themselves. So uh, I think they're going to be. Uh, this could be really good for the, for our club as well as for the for the area for schools as well. Okay, it's been a uh, basically a perfect hour, and so uh, I, I'm going to thank you, thank you, Bill and uh, Michael and Paul thank you. and. Um, uh, Jay Pasikoff uh, for uh, giving us updates on what's been going on this past uh, year. And so uh, I wish you a, a, a wonderful next year, 2022. Uh, 
fun holidays and um, good food. And uh, may we all um, enjoy less uh, COVID <laughs> in next year. So uh, anything else, uh, Michael, Bill, do, are we all good? Yeah, there's one question. Uh, let's see, what club is running the planetarium thing? Uh, we're not running anything just yet. We're, we hope to get it. It's the uh, it's the RESC, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, the Vancouver uh, chapter. Um, uh, there's enthusiasm in our club, so we might uh, end up getting it, despite what the council's saying right now. So. <laughs> I wish you good luck and encourage. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you all. I, I call this uh, meeting closed. Thank you. Bye-bye.